Greetings. My name is Colin Knapp, and I am the senior pastor of this beloved community that we call Pilgrim Congregational Church. Today is October 18th. It is the 20th Sunday of Pentecost, and I am so glad that you have decided to join us for worship today. Pilgrim is an open and affirming congregation in the United Church of Christ, and we gather together every week to ask questions and to find hope and to share the love of Jesus Christ. I'm glad that you're here. Thanks for joining us.
hear these words calling us to worship. Loving God, we come together to worship, longing for tenderness, because this world can be hard. We come longing for light, because our lives are crowded with shadows. We come desperately needing direction. Fill us this morning with your peace. Your spirit is our peace and our path. Come and worship. Welcome to Pilgrim Congregational Church, United Church of Christ's online worship service on October 18th, 2020, the 20th Sunday after Pentecost. My name is Sally Olson and I'll be your liturgist today. Please join me in our opening prayer. God of the open road, God of the twisting path, God of the narrow and upward way, your people are gathered for worship. In this hour, give us provision for the journey, courage and faith and compassion, and endurance to face any hardship. Open our eyes to see you walking beside us, protecting us, encouraging us, loving us. We pray this in the name of Jesus, who moves us. Amen. And now, please join me in our opening hymn. join me now in our confession. Let us confess our sins before God and one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we might delight in your will and follow in your ways to the glory of your name. your name. And now, my friends, hear the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. By dying, Christ destroyed our death. In rising, Christ restores our life. In giving us his spirit, he grants us peace. May the peace of Christ be with you. of Christ be with you, Pilgrim. Peace be 
with you. Hope you're staying safe and healthy and finding some time to breathe. One more time. Peace be with you. Seasons change, but Christ's peace is year round, sending the peace of Christ to you all. If this is the first time you're joining us in our worship service, welcome. This morning, I have a little clue of what we're going to talk about, and here it is. That's right, we're going to talk about questions this morning. And we're going to look at it in a couple different ways. Let's start with you're in school with your teacher. And your teacher's talking about division, and you don't know or understand exactly how to do it. What would your first response be? It should be raise your hand, of course, to say, I have a question. That would be a way to learn more about division. Now, what if you raise your hand and you ask the teacher the question, and the teacher says, I'm sorry, I don't want any questions. If you don't understand, you don't understand. Would that be a very good teacher? I don't think so. Because questions are important, especially in education. So now let's look at it a different way. You've met somebody new. And what's the best way to get to know them? Well, ask them a few questions, of course. And here's a few that you might want to ask that would give us some interesting answers. If you had a time machine, would you go back in time or visit the future? What's your favorite game to play? Or your favorite thing to eat? If you could visit one place on the earth, where would you go? What makes you the angriest? Or what makes you smile the most? Would you rather be rich or famous? Here's one of my favorite. If you were a superhero, what would your power be? If you could change anything about yourself, what would it be? Those are all interesting questions and maybe you can send me some of your answers because I'd love to hear what your answers were. But that way you would get to know more about a person, wouldn't you? Well, today we're talking about questions about our faith. In so many stories in the Bible, as Jesus traveled around, people asked him questions. And Jesus wanted to answer those questions. Even the ones where people were trying to trick him, he wanted to answer those questions. He wanted people to know about God's love and understand it more. And it's not any different today. You probably all have questions about your faith, no matter how young or old you are. And that is important to keep on asking questions because once we stop asking questions, we stop learning, no matter what the subject is. Let us pray. Dear God, I hear you saying, keep those questions coming. Keep on exploring your faith. Keep on looking to others to help you understand where you are on your faith journey. Because faith is something that grows and grows and grows and only happens with questions. Amen. Our reading today is from Exodus 3, verses 13 through 15. Just before our reading today, Moses has encountered God in the burning bush and has been told that God has chosen him to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. Moses responds with a number of questions, and our passage today begins with one of those. But Moses said to God, If I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? 
God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, thus you shall say to the Israelites, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my title for all generations. A word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Today, we conclude our series on our core values. We've covered a lot of ground here these past seven weeks. We've talked about a welcome without reservations, a bold, inclusive approach, caring for our fragile, good earth, a theological generosity, the fact that Jesus and justice go together, all these things that make us, well, they make us uniquely us. And as we have done so, it is my hope that these values we've touched upon not only challenge us with a renewed vision, but also help us to remember who we have in fact always strived to be as a community of people who come together to worship God and to care for one another and our community. Now the last value in my mind that we will talk about today is connected to what we talked about last week, that we always seek to be generous to one another theologically. And so today we take up the simple but important value that questions are good and doubt is a part of faith. That doubt is not to be ignored or repressed. Genuine questions are not to be silenced. For these things help us to grow and to wonder and to imagine and to meet the Holy Spirit with vulnerability and humility. This is, in fact, central to what it means to be a part of our denomination, the United Church of Christ. You know, in the past 75 years, denominations in the United States have become increasingly corporate in their operations. I'll leave that to you to decide whether or not that's a good thing or a bad thing. But of course, one of the things that it means is that we have developed these slogans and catchphrases and maxims. The first church that I really got engaged with was the United Methodist Church, and their main slogan was, open minds, open hearts, open doors, which is really nice to say. The problem was that that phrase was never really contextualized around anything. Anyone that I asked, they really couldn't tell me what it referred to. Apparently, we were just ambiguously open, which is, again, nice, but also sort of meaningless. Now, the United Church of Christ has its own catchphrases, too. Several, in fact. You've probably heard them said from time to time. You may even say them now without knowing where they come from. The most common one, God is still speaking. Sometimes attached to that one, we throw in, don't place a period where God has put a comma. But the one I want to focus on today is testimonies, not tests. It refers to how we in the United Church of Christ view the creeds. Now, in some churches, churches of various theological persuasions, it is often an unspoken expectation that members will be able to affirm the Apostles or the Nicene Creed, sometimes both. In some Reformed circles, it's common for the Heidelberg Catechism to be read aloud in worship services as a sort of call and response. It's taught to children in Sunday school. Even sometimes they are expected to memorize it during confirmation. It is in this way that creeds function as a sort of unintentional, although sometimes intentional, test. 
not so for us here. Now, that's not to say that we don't have agreed upon creeds because in fact, we do. You might be surprised to know that we do actually. We do have a statement of faith. It's right there on the UCC's website under the about and then what we believe section. I encourage you to check it out, although not right now. The difference is that we don't require anyone to affirm it, to participate in the life of our church. It isn't a test, but rather a testimony. It is what we believe on our best days, what we hope to believe most days, and what, frankly, we struggle to believe in our periods of doubt. It speaks to what the community holds together for one another. It is in this way that we recognize the freedom and autonomy of each person, especially when it comes to their individual beliefs that so many of us and the UCC have come to cherish. In other words, doctrine is not a box to be checked. It is not a marker of the insiders or the outsiders. Rather, it is a sign that points in the direction of what we believe God is all about. It is in this way that questions become a natural and welcomed part of our faith journeys with and towards God. We see folks asking questions directly to God in Scripture, too, and so we know that we're on solid ground here. Our Exodus reading is a prime example of such questioning. Now, what we read of in Exodus chapter 3 is actually a longer conversation between Moses and God. We're only reading just a little middle bit of it. Now, this is not yet the Moses that leads the people of Israel out of Egypt and into the wilderness. The person who speaks with God face to face. This is not the Moses who speaks with confidence about God's desire for human flourishing, but rather, this is the Moses who mostly sees himself as a failure, an exile. This is a young man who has an anger problem, who has run away from a tragic mistake. And so in the midst of this conversation, he asks God a question. If I come to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they say to me, what is his name? What shall I tell them? Moses asks a question, what is your name? To ask a person's name is to ask about their identity. It is to seek to know someone. Isn't that a question we all have for God? Who are you? Really? What are you all about? What is your name? Now, there are just a couple things I want to draw your attention to here from the Exodus text. The first thing, the motive for the question. Moses is not asking out of suspicion. This isn't a game of devil's advocate or a gotcha moment. Moses' question doesn't contain even a hint of hostility. By asking the question, Moses, in fact, is showing some vulnerability, courage, and an openness. Remember, Moses is talking to a burning bush here. It's, it's not as if he exactly knows how the divine presence will respond. He isn't exactly in control of the situation. And so the question is about moving forward in the future. It is in seeking to know the divine presence better and thus follow where that presence is leading him. The second thing to pay attention to, God's response. Moses is open 
And that leads to God being open. God does not mock or rebuke Moses. We can all remember times when a question was met with such a response. But not so here. Not with God. God answers the question. Not only does God answer the question, but God does so in a way that invites more questions. It's really quite wonderful, honestly. As one commentator summed up nicely, human questions lead to fuller divine revelation. Isn't that nice? Lastly, God answering the question doesn't make our understanding of God any clearer. The name of God, most commonly translated into English as I am who I am or I will be who I will be. This is the name of a God who is beyond our power to control. God will not be made into a neat and tidy thing. God will not be undone or explained concisely by our reason alone. God is beyond us in every conceivable way. And the more we seek to know God, the more we realize just how little we actually, in fact, do know. This is the mystery of faith. And rather than do away with it, I would encourage you to embrace it and to let it lead you to more questions. Because this place is a community that welcomes such questions. We are a community of questioners. And we see those questions as a valid expression of a faithful wondering, of a devout longing to know God and to be responsive to the call of God in each of our lives. I have questions too. I'm not just preaching to you, but to myself. And so we welcome those questions. We acknowledge our doubts and we affirm the divine presence of those who have gone before us and testified to God's love and call in their own lives. So come, come with every part of who you are. This is not a place for those who have it all figured out. Come with your questions, come with your doubt. May it be so for you, in the name of the triune God. Amen.
my treasure, my precious one. You are the reason I sent my only son. You are my chosen, my new creation, my own beloved. Pilgrims, this is Christine Vesley from the Stewardship Committee. Warning, this is not a traditional year and this will not be your traditional stewardship moment, but have no fear friends, those will come in the following weeks. The Stewardship Committee thought you might like a picture of where church money comes from and where it goes. I'm going to show you two charts with that information. So here we go. Both of the charts are based on the 2020 budget. First, where does the church get its income? There are three sources of church income, pledge and plate, rentals, and donuts. In this chart, you'll notice that the donut income is shown as net of the donut expenses and the partner sharing. All the other numbers, the pledge and plate and rental, are just as they are experienced in the church. As you can see, pledge and plate, money we receive directly from you, is a crucial part of our revenues, but not the only source of revenue. So now, where does the money go? As you can see, there are more categories of church expenses, but I believe that each pie piece on the chart is self-explanatory. Staff costs, ministry costs, 
building costs and benevolences are the major components of our expenses. Friends, I hope this message provides you with information about how important your pledges are to the church operations. In a climate where our donut operations and rental income are precarious, your pledges will be crucial to maintain our church operations. I pray that this information will help you to consider how your generous pledge will allow the church to thrive in 2021. I invite you now to join me in prayer. You are welcome to share your prayer joys and concerns online during this service in the chat. Be aware though that they are publicly viewable. To submit them through our website or contact a deacon for healing prayer by phone. Please pray with me. Gracious and loving God, in whom we live and move and have our being, we praise you for the gift of life on this good earth. We thank you for the blessings that come with each season of the year and each season of our lives. We thank you for the autumn's crisp air and promise of harvest. And as we spend more time indoors, God, we also acknowledge ongoing concerns about the coronavirus. We thought pandemics didn't happen in the modern world, but our efforts to control COVID-19 feel somewhat futile. This week, Illinois recorded 4,015 new cases, a single day record, and we grieve that we also suffered collectively the most deaths in a day since late June. Many European countries are returning to full or partial lockdowns, and a number of pharmaceutical firms have halted their COVID-19 vaccination trials. And so we pray for all our world, Lord. Hear our prayer and let our cry come to you. We pray for safety in our workplaces, schools, and neighborhoods, and for the physical, emotional, and economic well-being of our communities. We pray for those in positions of leadership, help them lead with wisdom and discernment during these challenging times. God, our, our country is at a crossroads. The Supreme Court hangs in the balance. Science is in a battle with conjecture and instinct. The U.S. is reckoning with centuries of racial injustice. And Lord, we are beginning to feel weary and worn out just when the world needs our energy and advocacy most. Grant us all the patience, calm, and commitment to be caring neighbors, seeking the welfare of our communities, and working together to protect the most vulnerable in our midst. Merciful God, we lift up to you those known to us and known to you who are kneeling of your need of your healing touch on their bodies, minds, or souls. We lift up especially Carol's Aunt Fran, who has suffered another stroke and is trying to recuperate. Sue's grandson, who has tested positive for COVID and is in Navy boot camp, so not allowed to communicate with home. Joycelyn's friend David, who fell off his bicycle and shattered his clavicle and will need surgery. Hold close all who mourn the loss of dearly beloved, including the family of Wesley Richard, Assure us once again that love is more powerful than death. Knowing your love extends to all humanity and all creation, we ask that you watch over refugees, immigrants, prisoners, and all who lack safe and secure shelter and nourishment. We pray for your presence in all places of the world afflicted by war, famine, and weather-related calamities. In the U.S., we have seen a record number of hurricanes make landfall this year, and nearly four dozen uncontained wildfires are currently burning in the West, forcing evacuations from California to Colorado. Much of South America has experienced a severe heat wave over recent weeks, and in Southeast Asia, there's been severe flooding across parts of Vietnam and Cambodia, with over a month's worth of rain falling in just the first 10 days of this month. Lord, please help us be better stewards of your creation, to make decisions and take actions that minimize the loss of life 
and damage that occurs during these natural disasters and to have the discipline and courage to make decisions and take actions to heal versus harm this amazing planet. God, in these tumultuous times, you remain the rock on which we stand. You are our strength, our refuge, our hope, and our guide. Please grant us the wisdom, humility, and desire to become instruments of your peace, mercy, and justice. We pray this and all the prayers unspoken in our hearts, in Jesus' name. And now let us join together in community to pray the Lord's Prayer, each in the words most meaningful to us as individuals. Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Making an offering is a holy act that demonstrates our gratitude and commitment to God. This is the time when we return to God some portion of what God has given to us. You are invited to give to Pilgrim Church in any of the following ways. Online at www.pilgrimoakpark.org. You can select giving, the giving from the menu, or click on the Give to Pilgrim button via the Tithely app downloaded on your phone by texting GIVE to 833-721-1098 or by mailing a check to the church office. We ask that you give as generously as you're able. Please join me in a prayer dedicating our gifts to God's use. Gracious God, we long for the time when the meek shall inherit the earth, and all who hunger and thirst after justice shall be satisfied. And we believe that, despite the persistence of evil, now is always the time when more good can be done and we can make a difference. May it be so through the offering of these gifts and the offering of our lives. Amen. And now, as we come to the end of the service, I have several announcements to share with you. 
On November 1st, we will celebrate All Saints Day with a special communion liturgy of remembrance. We invite you to submit names of loved ones that you would like for Pastor Colin and I to read during the liturgy. Please send the names to Joycelyn at office at pilgrimoakpark.org by October 28th. And because we will be reading the names during the service, we ask that you indicate the correct pronunciation in your email submission. This autumn, we are going to collect canned food goods and non-perishable food items for Beyond Hunger. And there are several ways in which you can participate. You can drop off items anytime at Debbie Kent's house on her front porch. You can join us at our first annual Trunk or Treat event in the church parking lot on October 31st at 2 to 3 p.m., where we will have boxes to collect your items. Or you can contact Sally Olson, and she will arrange for items to be picked up at your home. More details can be found in the weekly What's Happening at Pilgrim email. A quick reminder that next Sunday, October 25th, from 1130 to 1230, children are invited to attend Connect here in person. If you haven't done so already, please contact Maureen Dale immediately to let her know that you are coming. Next Sunday, during Adult Ed at 9 a.m. via Zoom, we will be joined by Sarah and Mike Hoag from the Euclid Avenue Methodist Church here in Oak Park from their reparations working group. They will share some of their experiences and insights from their work, providing an opportunity for reflection and inspiration for those of us here at Pilgrim. I hope you will join us and you can find more information and the Zoom link on our website. Looking ahead a few weeks after Animate Faith, the small group study that uh, Pastor Colin has been leading on Sunday evenings wrap up, I will be leading a two-part in-person small group discussion of Jamar Tisby's book, The Color of Compromise. We will meet on Sunday, November 8th and 15th from 5 to 6.15 here at Pilgrim and advanced registration will be required, so please email me to sign up. If you have a moment this week, as always, we invite you to record a brief Passing of the Peace video. It will be much appreciated, and please send that to Delena Wilkerson. And also, I hope to see you after worship today in Fellowship Hour. The Zoom link is available on our, work, our website. And now, please join me in singing our closing hymn. And now, my brothers and sisters, receive this benediction. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Come with your questions. Come with your doubts. And I promise God will meet you there. So go in peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>